Welcome to The Conversation, the programme where we bring together two women linked by a passion, profession or an experience. I'm Mariam Maruth, and today I'm in conversation with two people who both escaped forced marriage. As teenagers, they were set to marry men they didn't know, and when they rejected those men, they were disowned by their families and ostracised by their communities. They now help other women who've been married against their will. For the last 25 years, Jasvinda Sangera has been one of Britain's leading campaigners against forced marriages. She grew up in a large Sikh household in Northern England, and when she was 16 years old, ran away to escape an unwanted marriage. She set up a charity, Karma Nirvana, which started off in Jasvinda's living room, but now, by their count, has helped over 50,000 women and in 2014 was instrumental in making forced marriages a criminal offence in England and Wales. And Frady Reese, who's based in the US. She was raised in an ultra-Orthodox Jewish community in New York and coerced into marriage at 19. She overcame domestic abuse and after 15 years managed to flee with her two daughters. Frady also set up an organisation, Unchained at Last, that gives legal and financial support to women trying to leave forced marriages. Welcome, Jasvinda and Frady. And unusually for the programme, you both have actually met each other once before. Yes, it happened to be. It was a wonderful coincidence. We at Unchained at Last, we organize these regular protests that we call chain-ins to protest forced and child marriage. And it happened to be that at our first chain-in last year in New York City, Jess Vinder was going to be in New York City. And somehow we both figured that out. And I asked if she would speak at our chain-in, and she did. It was uh, a wonderful experience and it was such a great opportunity for me to meet somebody who I've always considered uh, one of my role models as I work to end forced marriage in America. Well, thank you. And I was incredibly moved by you. In fact, what happened, uh, Freddie, on the day is I just landed. I didn't tell you this because I didn't want you to say, you know, it's okay, you don't have to turn up. I landed three hours before I went into New York City with you handed me a megaphone and I was there taking part. I was absolutely moved by the um, activism of yourself and the people around me because I certainly haven't ever done anything like that in the UK. So thank you. It was well worth it. I've not forgotten it since. (laughs) (laughs) I just wanted to start off, first of all, by asking you both. um, Was the idea of a wedding something that you ever kind of looked forward to? Was it something that you kind of at one point had a positive association with? Uh, Well, I personally never had a positive association with marriage at all. I'm one of seven sisters and in order of age, there's one younger than me. So before me, I'd watched my sisters having to be married at very young ages, as young as 15, and they would disappear to become this wife and go to India, come back, not go back to school and then go into these marriages and be physically and psychologically abused. And my impression of marriage was this is what happens to you. You get married, you get beaten up, and then you're told to stay there. Yes, and unfortunately, I was not as smart as you, Jasminder, because I was very excited to marry. I was one of six. I was second to youngest. All my older sisters and brothers were married off at a young age, and I was waiting for my turn. This was what I was groomed for my entire life. And uh, my parents' marriage was extremely abusive. And yet it never occurred to me, hey, this could happen to you too. Mm. Freddie, can you tell us, like, just sort of establish what is then the kind of the definition of a forced marriage? Well, the definition of a forced marriage is one in which one or both parties does not give full, free, informed consent, either at the point of entry into the marriage or afterward. So, for example, in my situation, and it, it never occurred to me that my marriage was forced or even arranged. So the community that I come from, they don't use the word arranged marriage. But the question of whether I was going to get married was not asked. I was told I was going to get married. The question of when was not asked. I was told it would be right after I graduated from high school. And I was told I had some choice about whom to marry, but even that I didn't realize at the time was not really a choice. I had to wait for the matchmaker to bring me someone. And then I had a matter of hours over a period of a few weeks to decide whether to marry him, even though I was never allowed to be alone with him or have any physical contact with him. And even though I was under tremendous pressure from my family and community to say yes. And what kind of community was that? It was obviously very, you know, it, it felt very kind of constrained at the time. But was that the sort of pressure that you grew to expect then? Well, at, at the time, I didn't see it as stifling and I didn't see it as pressure. But I grew up in a very insular religious community. I went to an all-girls religious school where I was groomed the entire time. 
to marry young, to become a wife and a mother, we've learned a lot of, about cooking and sewing and very little of math and science. Right. And just Vinda, was it a similar experience for you? How much freedom did you have growing up? Well, we had no freedom whatsoever. Everything was watched, monitored and controlled. We also understood that we had to be careful how we behave, so not to shame the family. And what Fred is describing, I totally understand, because one of the things I understand is the conditioning and the grooming from a very young age, of which none of us dare ever question. And I always think about my sisters now, looking back, you know, they went into their marriages in exactly the way Freddie describes, excited, didn't question it. I don't think I was smart of Freddy. I, I just don't know what it was within me. My mother used to say you were born upside down, you were different from birth, I was always difficult, etc. all those things. And maybe she helped me out because, you know, made me question a number of things. And, it, I, and then when I was shown the photograph of this man, as a 14-year-old, knowing that I'd been promised to him from the age of eight and looking at this picture and being expected to contemplate marriage, I looked at this picture thinking, well, he's shorter than me and he's very much older than me. And just as a 14-year-old kid thinking, I don't want this. And it was as simple as that for me. Was there anyone that you could actually openly talk to about and say, I, I don't want to go through this? Absolutely not, because um, within our family dynamic, we were taught to be silent. And we understood that if you spoke outside the family, then you brought shame to the family. So we understood that that speaking outside of the family to anybody about any of your problems meant that you would be in trouble. And it could, in fact, hurry on a marriage very quickly because mm. of the shame. And they would want to deal with that. That sounds very familiar. It, it, talking about your problems, even within your family, is is really frowned upon. And anytime there's a problem, it's you know, keep it quiet, keep it quiet, because otherwise nobody's going to want to marry into the yeah. family. That beca- it, it's going to ruin your siblings' marriage prospects. Sure. Yeah. And so, afraid you felt you kind of had no choice in the matter. You had to go ahead with it with the, with the marriage. Well, it, it was more than a photograph. I did get to meet him, but. Even, you know, these meetings, the the pressure on me, well, let's put it this way, the benefits of saying yes were tremendous. The consequences of saying no were even bigger. And also, when you've never been um, allowed to date and experience any anything with boys whatsoever, all of a sudden you're be- being given permission to be in a room with a man, you know, your family are okay with that. And there is something about that where you think, hang on, this is different. And actually, this is quite exciting, actually, because everybody is showering you with attention and encouraging you to become the wife of this person actually that's what they're doing that's right so I always say there's bribery involved too you know as as a teenager when you're from a large family and you've never had a birthday party or any party in your honor Mm. and you know if you say yes to what they're all telling you to say yes to Mm. there's a be Lots of parties in your honor. You get a whole new wardrobe mm. and new dishes and mm-hmm. pots and pans. I mean, that's really compelling for a teenager yeah. who's never been the center of attention. Absolutely. And just, Vinda, so what was it that made you then ultimately leave home at the age of 16? What were the events leading up to, to um, that decision? I mean, for me, it was as basic as I did not want to marry a stranger. I, I was born here. I absolutely love school. And um, by saying no, my family took me out of education and they held me a prisoner in my own home. I was 15 and a half. And I was locked in this room and literally, you were not allowed to leave the room until I agreed to the marriage. So in the end, I said yes, purely to plan my escape. And And it was as simple as that because then I had freedom of movement. And I ran away from home at the age of 16 because I had hoped they would say, "Okay, you've made your point now, you know, you can come back and you don't have to marry this stranger. How did you run away? So you were in a locked room. Like, What was the moment that you thought, I've, I've got to run for it, I've got to go? Well, I, I it's interesting because my, my parents, we were never allowed to have friends and the in friends we were allowed were from our same background, so they had to be from an Asian community as well, an Indian community. And my best friend, um, who was Indian, her brother was the one who helped me in the end, and he became my secret boyfriend. And um, she was allowed to talk to me and come and see me, and we planned it that way, and he helped me to run away from home. So was that m- moment when you were, like, you know, running away, how did that make you feel at that young age? I mean, were you scared? Were you sad? Were you liberated or...? Absolutely petrified. Petrified of what I was doing to my family. Never did I feel liberation, but relief I did that I didn't have to marry this man because it was imminent. And that's when I left, when I knew the tickets were planned and we were going to India. Um, Only later on when things settled down did I begin to think, um, I've done it, you know, and... but. 
where's my family? I want my family. I was missing them terribly. And how did you make contact with them during the first call back? Yeah, you... I absolutely do because my um, parents reported me missing to the police and it was the police officer who told me I had to ring home to let them know I was safe and well. And I rang home, I was 16, and my mother answered the phone and I, I said, Mum, it's me. You know, I want to come home but I don't want, want to marry that stranger. Her response has stayed with me for the rest of my life. She said, you either come back and marry who we say, or from this day forward, you are now dead in our eyes. And that was a choice I was faced with at the age of 16. And Freddy, for you, you agreed to this marriage and you found yourself in this very difficult relationship. What happened to you when you tried to, to seek help? Well, it took only one week for me to realize that this stranger that I had been married off to was abusive and violent and that my life was in danger, and yet it took a full 15 years until I was able to get out. Everything was uh, was closed off to me. So I had, uh, under Orthodox Jewish law, I had no legal rights in terms of divorce. A man is allowed to divorce his wife under Orthodox Jewish law. A woman is not allowed to divorce her husband. I had no reproductive rights. I was not allowed to use birth control. My first child was born 11 months after my wedding. Pretty soon I had two daughters. I also had no financial rights. I was not allowed to work. I was not allowed to have a credit card or a bank account in my own name. Goodness. My only option at my only exit or escape would be if my family helped me. But when I went to my family and asked for help, it was, well, I mean, you said yes to this. Marriage is forever. He's young. He needs to grow up. You, you have to learn to live with him. You've both talked about the idea of shame. When do you think you were able to move beyond that? For me, it was the moment that my family declared me dead that was, ironically, very liberating. I can't shame them anymore if I'm dead. Yeah, I understand that um, entirely. And my mother told me that I was dead in her eyes at 16, but I didn't actually own it then. I kept on going back to my family, begging for you know anything just to accept me or part of me and constantly being rejected by them. I did that for many years. And it was only when my sister, Rabina, who was in her early 20s, she committed suicide. She set herself on fire and she died. And Rubina was in the most horrific marriage, forced to marry at the age of 15. And again, the pattern was in that relationship, she'd go to family who would encourage her to go back to the perpetrator for fear of shaming. So when she was, I say, driven to commit suicide, that was the turning point for me. And as a result of that, you, you set up charity, mm. Karma Nirvana. Mm. I mean, was that was sort of your way of reclaiming, you know, what's yeah. happened. Yeah, and for the first time ever to start talking about my personal experiences and what had happened to my sister, because I hadn't before that then. So it was a space for me to start speaking about this instead of doing what my family wanted us to do, and that was to never speak about Rabina again. The charity has become a space where I have put in that energy. And Freddie, for you, so how did you, in the end, get out of that relationship? How did you leave that relationship? For me, the escape was through education. I became the first person in my family to go to college when I was 27, still married, had two children. And my family was really upset about this, tried to talk me out of it, but I graduated in 32 and, uh, and managed to leave. And then it was very very similar to what you just said, Jasmine Durr. It was, uh, it was a way to turn my trauma into a way to help others. And I think a lot of it is survivor's guilt. It, well, how did I get out? How did I manage? And so many other women are trapped. How did you adjust, you know, with your two two daughters to being kind of, you know, in the outside world, so to speak? Well, it was huge because remember, we had grown up in such an insular community. We didn't know the first thing about wearing jeans or we always had worn long skirts and tights. And I thought hamburgers were made out of ham. I, I mean, we didn't know the first thing. Someone had to explain to me what the Beatles were. You know, what uh, the... I was introduced to them only about five years ago. <laughs> <laughs> I never forget, I'm sorry to interrupt, but not having to look over my shoulder and getting used to not being told what to do. And all of a sudden, the rules of engagement changed and I was living a life without worrying about shaming my family. It's bizarre. 
But it's also scary because I was yeah. used to having a rule and a limit for every second of the day. I mean, there is a rule for how you get out of bed yeah. and how you wash your hand and what you eat and when you <laughs> eat and how you eat it. And all of a sudden, it's completely open. You can you can date whoever you want. You can have sex <laughs> with whoever you want. You can eat whatever you want. You can go wherever you freedom. want. You can wear. <laughs> freedom can be really scary. So that took a while. And then remember, we were dealing, my daughters and I were dealing with this sudden, <laughs> almost terrifying freedom at the same time that we were dealing with the loss of our entire family family yeah. and community. Yeah. So we were all alone, suddenly adrift in a really big, scary world. And uh, thank goodness we found our way. And so when you were ostracized, as it were, how did it feel to be cut off like that? I think it, it takes some time to even grasp what that means. I think at first I was a little bit in denial. And Jess Vendor, I wonder, did you have that too? Did you think, well, some time will pass, they'll change their minds? Absolutely. Absolutely. And then you start, for me personally, I started to live in hope. For example, when I gave birth to my daughter Natasha, I was 19 and a half and I thought having a baby might make my mother's heart soften. When in fact, all it was doing was reinforcing my discernment. Yeah, and I had those moments also. I remember there was one moment that I called my mother. I had a tumor in my breast that I had to have removed. It looked like cancer. When I finally got a clean bill of health, I had this moment, an emotional moment, where I just wanted to share this with my mother who yeah. hadn't spoken to me in a year. And mm -hmm. I called her and started crying. And I said, I just called to tell you that I don't have cancer. It must sound crazy to you because you never thought I had cancer. Yeah. And she said, well, actually, I did hear that you have cancer. And it occurred to me that my mother thought that I had breast cancer and still hadn't reached out to me. And I realized then that dead means dead. Yeah. That was I, the last time I spoke with her. Yeah, and then you stop appealing to their compassion. I've learned to live my life with no expectations of family whatsoever. And, you know, I've never had a birthday card in 35 years in either of my children. You know, we have celebrations in our uh, culture. Diwali is a huge one, you know. We celebrate Christmas. But the point is, these are significant times and events in your life where you expect family to be. We've learned to live our lives without that. For my children, it's a total blank on their mother's side when it comes to family. And for my kids, unfortunately, it's their father's side too. You do learn to adjust, but that that hole never goes away. There's that. There's no. a pain. But you know, when I look at, I'm a grandmother now, so I have a grandson who is three years old. My daughter's expecting her third child in March this year. And you know, when I look at them and I think to myself, they're never going to inherit that legacy of abuse because of the decision I made when I was 16, and that really makes me feel a lot stronger. It fills that hole, Freddie, in all honesty, because. I don't, I'm sure you don't either take your independence for granted. We had to fight for that. But the point is, when you look at your children and the future generations, for me, I look back, I have absolutely no regrets whatsoever. Oh, same here. Yes, absolutely. And my older daughter especially, she was old enough when we left to see what was happening. I think both of my children really appreciate the, yeah. the sacrifices that I have made so that they don't have to have those same struggles. If you're just tuning in now, you're listening to the conversation on the BBC World Service. We're hearing from two incredible women who've escaped forced marriage, Jasvinda Sangera and Frady Reese, and have gone to use their experiences to support other women. So Frady, I'd like to hear from you. So how did you... Um, when did you decide to set up your organization to support other women? It was the day that I bought my house. So when I left, obviously, becoming financially independent and becoming emotionally dependent are both uh, tremendous endeavors. And when I finally became self-sufficient enough that I was able to buy a house, I, at the closing, was filled with this tremendous sense of gratitude and, and I suppose a lot of survivor's guilt as well. And I thought, well, I made it. So many other women and girls are still back where I was. How, how can I help them? How can I, how can I make sure that they're not completely alone going through this trauma the way I was? So how did you go about helping others like you? Well, I started out by saying one of the most basic needs that women have in these situations is legal. They need legal representation, and because they often don't have any money, they can't afford it. We very quickly realized, though, there are so many other needs that I had and that these women have, and so we also provide emotional support, all kinds of social services, everything from emergency financial assistance to financial coaching, figuring out how to apply for your first credit card, how to open up your first bank account, that sort of thing. And is this within the Jewish community, or are 
you working with people sort of across sort of religions and cultures? Oh, no. From the beginning, I knew that this was not happening only to people from my former community, that this is happening to women and girls in many different cultures and religions and communities across the U.S. and across the world. So from the beginning, we've been a multicultural organization. And what's the scale? Like how many women over the past year, for instance, have you, have you helped? Well, we're a tiny little organization. I just became a paid staffer last year. I, I was running this as a volunteer out of my living room. So Jez Vendor is another thing we have in common. Mm-hmm. And I was also a single mom raising two children and working full time. And I thought, well, you know, this will take a couple of hours on the side. By the end of the first year, without any promotion, advertising, or any paid staffers, we were already helping 30 women. So we realized very quickly, this is something much bigger than two hours on the side every week. Um, So we just moved into an office last year. We just hired a second staffer. And so far, we've helped uh, more than 170 women and girls. Well, and just, just Vinda, obviously, for you, the scale is slightly different because you've been doing, you know, for 25 years, the, almost the organization's mm-hmm. been going for. And I believe you get up to around sort of 700 calls a month. Yeah. A month. yeah. I mean, but, but I identify, Fred, with everything you're saying, because in the first seven years, um, it, um, literally, we had no funding whatsoever. Nobody wanted to know. It was always show us the evidence, prove it. And I would say, well, I am the evidence. It happened to me. But it was one of those issues where people quickly wanted to sweep it under the carpet. And when we managed to secure some national lottery, funding back in 98 that was when we were able to employ two people and I was one of the two and then you're up against this backlash of people feeling that isn't it cultural isn't it part of what you do your traditional religion and you're the face of all that as well so we've made a huge impact we're a relatively small size organization but we have a big passion and that's what I recognize in you Freddie. Oh, well, thank you. And and this is why you are one of my role models, because you turned it into something you're running out of your living room into the national, the international presence that it is today. What we don't have yet in the U.S. is a recognition that forced marriage is a problem, is a widespread problem. And it's not just the other. It's not just that one community. So I'm just awed by the way that you've done that in the U.K. You actually managed to criminalize forced marriage. I mean, I, I hope in 20 years I can say I've accomplished a quarter of what you've accomplished. Well, I I can tell you that you will, and you already are. And, you know, for us, albeit we say, for example, the criminal offence, it took us 10 years to campaign for criminal law. And just to be clear on that, on the criminalisation, so you were instrumental in Mm. making sure that forced marriages is illegal in England Mm. and Wales, and that was only passed two and a half years ago, I think, wasn't it? Yeah, sure. I always say it's really important to to move people, and I have to say, it's quite simple. I was born in England. (laughs) England is my home, you know. I want to be afforded the same level of protection as my white counterparts here in Britain. That's why I expect... If it starts getting watered down and I'm treated differently because it all of a sudden becomes cultural, well, that is not right. So we have to root this within a violence against women and girls framework and a human rights framework. And it's as simple as that. And what I try to do a lot in the U.S. to to combat that same type of stereotyping is... Just, first of all, I'm Exhibit A. Often when I meet people the first time, they say, oh, but you're white. Mm. Well, yeah. Oh, this happens to white people? Yeah. <laughs> yes, it does. Um, but over the years, I've met other survivors of forced marriage from so many different backgrounds. Yeah. And the more of us from different backgrounds who come together and tell our stories, the sure. more we can prove to the world this is not just one group. This is not just one religion or culture that's doing this. This is a gender that's violence true. issue that transcends You've both talked about, um, you know, when you were ostracised from your communities. Do you still feel any danger or receive any threats from those communities or from from others challenging the work that you're doing? All the time. Yeah. Um, I don't know about you, Jasvinder, but uh, but I get uh, threats. And that's just from random people who read about me, from people from my former community. And uh, also, if I'm working with a specific uh, woman or girl and helping her, then uh, often the threats will come from her family. And I certainly can identify with that. But the good news is, Freddy, is that as we raise our head above the parapet, we know we're going to be unpopular. This is why we've got to take more people with us. How about your own children? Like, so, you know, you, you know, their lives must differ so much from the expectations that were foisted on the both mm-hmm. of you. Yeah. <laughs> 
from, from my <laughs> perspective, absolutely. And you almost live vicariously through your children because you want them to have everything you never had. You know, my daughter married an Asian man against my will, actually, but not me, it's my will, actually. But I was worried that she married an Asian boy, you don't marry an Asian boy, you marry a family. And I didn't want this family to take it out on her, that her mother was disowned, had run away from home, all these things. But thankfully for me, my, my fears were completely unfounded because here was an, an Indian family that did the exact opposite of what my family did. Mm-hmm. You know, that's how it should be. You know, and that, that isn't me stereotyping. That was my experience of growing up and I didn't want it for my daughter. For my daughters, I just wanted them to, to make their own choices. Yeah. And my older daughter is 21. She's graduating this year from college. She's the first person in the history of the family to go to college at a traditional age. (laughs) And uh, she has her whole life ahead of her. And, you know, I often tell my children, there's nothing that you can do that would ever make me shun you. There's Mm -hmm. nothing that any choice you make, even if I disagree with it, I love you and I support you. Mm -hmm. And just, Finder, where are you, what are the next steps for you then in terms of the organisation, in terms of what you want to achieve? Gosh, I mean, we mark 25 years next year and yeah, it's fantastic that, you know, forced marriages are criminal offences, all these things happening, but we still are on a journey. So it's identifying the younger generation to join forces and more people to come on board to do what they need to be doing because maybe I have to retire one day. (laughs) We never retire though, do I know we're not ever going to retire, but hey. (laughs) Any advice for Frady at all? Ah, I don't think I need to give Freddie any advice. Freddie, just keep doing what you're doing. I recognise that activism, that spirit within you and that sheer compassion you have for the cause. It's not work, is it, Freddie? It is it, it is what we do. Oh, no, it's absolutely <laughs> not work. But I certainly um, would, would love to follow up with you separately and get absolutely. any kind of advice that you yeah. can give. No, absolutely. I think one of the things that I recognise as well is, and maybe this is a bit of advice, Freddie, is that we really have to also look after ourselves. You know, it is very personal to us. And one of the things that we're really focusing on in the next five years is identifying survivors to share their stories. It's important they share their stories also. Thank you so much, both of you, for, for joining me. Um, Jasvinda Sangera's charity is called Karma Nirvana, and Freddy Reese is the founder of Unchained at Last, and both of them support women to escape forced marriages. Thank you very, very much, both of you. Thank you. Oh, thank you. I could have done this all day. I know, Freddy. <laughs>